We're live. All right, welcome everybody to our first Mutual Views and Brews. Um, my name is Taylor Feldman. I'm the Outdoor Programs Manager for the Mount St. Helens Institute. And Mount St. Helens Institute has been around since 1996, and we are proud to advance the understanding and stewardship of the earth through science, education, and exploration of volcanic landscapes. And now we have the opportunity to do it virtually, and we're so happy that you can join us. We believe in the power of science to help us lead, lead us down the right path, solve problems, inspire critical thinking, and make the world a better place. We believe that everyone, regardless of what they look like, their physical appearance, their physical ability, or economic status, should be able to learn from and be inspired by this volcano that's in our backyard. And no matter where you're joining in from, we encourage you to recognize and learn about the indigenous land on which you live. Mount St. Helens is a traditional cultural property of the Cowlitz Indian tribe and the Confederated Bands of the Yakima Nation. And we're really honored to have the Cowlitz Nation as um, on our board of directors. And together we offer joint programming for the Cowlitz youth as well as the general public. During this live stream, we'll be collecting questions via our Facebook Messenger. So if any questions pop up for either of our speakers, feel free to send us a message and we'll be sure to ask them at the end. Now I wanna introduce our speakers, Melanie Holmes and Jeff Renner. Melanie is a Chicago-based author of three nonfiction books and a recipient of the 2014 Global Media Award from the Population Institute in Washington, DC. She's joining us here from Chicago today. And Jeff is a Seattle-based retired journalist with an active speaking and consulting business. And he's also an executive producer and a host of a public affairs television program, Challenge 2.0. They both have a long and rich history with Mount St. Helens. And here I am to welcome Melanie and Jeff. Thank you very much, Taylor. It's good to be a part of the program. Hello, and thank you for having us. So as we start the presentation, we're gonna move into the next slide. And we have someone running it for us. So you'll hear me asking for next point or next slide. So just bear with us. We're all Zooming and it's kind of new for some of us. Starting out, I'd like to introduce uh, the man. So David Johnston is very well known in the Pacific Northwest. He was in, he was, he died in the line of duty in the Mount St. Helens eruption of 1980. So a lot of people know about how he died. Uh, the book, A Hero on Mount St. Helens is about how he lived. It does necessarily talk about the eruption and the science that he was studying. Uh, but I want to introduce the man to you. So if we can have just our first point there. David was born in December 1949, which means he had a late birthday compared to his cohorts in school, his peers growing up. Uh, so he was always the youngest. And genetics meant that uh, his growth spurts were coming later than his peers. So he was also the smallest. Uh, being youngest and the smallest had its downsides. He took a hit on his self-esteem. It, it had some anxiety uh, that, caused, that was caused for him. And our next point. So every generation has its reasons for anxiety, right? So for people in David's generation, the young, their young years in the 1950s, it meant that they were dealing with the Cold War. And for young people, that meant duck and cover in school, where you would duck under your uh, your desk and cover your head with your head with your hands. That was in case of nuclear attack. Uh, there were bomb shelters built in homes as well as communities. And that was the 1950s was the beginning of uh, Mach 1 busting 
uh, jets that were meant to keep the peace during the Cold War. Those sonic booms that were emanating from those jets, if you live near a big city as David did, those would punctuate your days. You could jump a foot if you're inside of a school or your home. Uh, so that was, there was a lot of anxiety around that era. The 1960s, when David was coming of age as a preteen and a teenager, that saw the assassination of a president, uh, JFK. So we haven't had that happen for the rest of the generations that have come after him. And I don't remember it. So someone uh, my age or younger, we have not experienced that kind of anxiety. That's a major event. Uh, David was a very aware teenager. He actually wrote in a journal that he remembers President Johnson, um, Lyndon, Lyndon B. Johnson coming on TV and doing a talk, a speech about civil rights after Selma. And then of course we have Vietnam. We had a whole generation of young men that were looking at Vietnam uh, in their futures. And David very much thought he was going to be entering Vietnam after graduation from high school. Our next point. Uh, so at the end of his high school, his senior year in high school was um, an F4 tornado hit his hometown of Oak Lawn. Still today, 53 years later, it is the deadliest tornado on, on record for Northeast Illinois. Uh, since it was in his hometown and since he was a photographer who would take pictures for school events, uh, parades, for the local newspaper where his mother worked, he went out with his father taking pictures of the destruction from that tornado. And it was absolutely devastating. There was great loss of life. Next point. Uh, so that was the end of his senior year. And as he entered fall, uh, in fall of 1967, he entered University of Illinois. He was still 17, so that December birthday meant that he was in college for four months before he turned 18, which also meant he was not, he was not going into Vietnam. He was still 17 when he went into college. Next point. So talking about David as a young boy growing up as a Boy Scout and doing lots of campouts uh, with friends and family uh, to national parks or state parks, you can see that he absolutely uh, had a lot of, he had a, a great love of the earth. Um, the role of science, I don't want to give spoilers for this book, but there's, there's some things that were formative in his life, uh, his home life, his family life, that led to um, a great respect for science. Of course, that tornado, that occurred when he was um, just 17. There wasn't the science, uh, the science didn't, wasn't mature enough to be able to warn people of what was coming. Um, and so he always did have a great respect for science. And before we, we move on to the next slide, I just wanna point out the name of this book is A Hero on Mount St. Helens, not The Hero. So David always saw himself as a member of a team of scientists. And definitely in 1980, uh, there was a team of people that were working to unlock the puzzle of that mountain. Uh, next slide. So we're going to uh, introduce the mountain now and this is the Cascade Range, and it does go up into British Columbia, but this map here starts at the Canadian border, Mount Baker at the north end, and then down into Northern California with Lassen Peak. Uh, go ahead and advance. So volcanology in the United States started in 1912 with private, a privately funded observatory the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. It was the efforts of private citizens that started that. It was about seven years until the government took it over. 
uh, next point, next point. And so, of course, there was there were practitioners of this science, but still, in 1962, uh, I'm showing you a booklet that was part of a collection that David owned as a about a 13 year old. A lot of different science topics. It came out from the Science Service. This particular book that he owned was called Volcanoes, and in it, it assert, asserted uh, that the Cascade Range was on the verge of extinction. It even talks about Mount Lassen's uh, last eruption in 1914 as being the, um, the last of, uh, you, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just read it really quickly. It was believed to be the final spasms of an old and dying volcano. And of course, we know that wasn't true. Uh, go ahead and to the next point. A lot happened in the 60s with volcanology. So the tectonic plate theory took hold. And by 1968, that's when Congress first approved a budget line for a volcano hazards program. And with that approval, projects were being funded, one of which was uh, a project under the supervision of Rocky Crandall. And later he was joined by Don Molino. And if you advance to the next point. Uh, so this is a copy of a report that came out in 1978 on Mount St. Helens. It's just the Crandall Molino report. In it, they talked about uh, how Mount St. Helens, the quiet interval would probably not last a thousand years. Instead, an eruption more likely to occur within the next hundred years and perhaps even before the end of the century. And as history shows, it, it was within two years after that report came out. And so if you'll go to the next point. So which brings us to March of 1980, which is when Mount St. Helens ended its 123 year dormant period and it first came to life. So, um, and from here, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Jeff. Well, thank you very much, Melanie. And I think that really gives us a wonderful perspective of the setup for this. I would flip back a couple of years to 1978 as that's when I first met David Johnston. Let's go to our next slide. Let me preface this by saying, as the science reporter at King TV, having just newly arrived from the Midwest, David and I found out that we had grown up for a period of time, just a couple of miles from each other. I was asked to take a mountain climbing course down at Mount Rainier. Now, having learned to ski, my idea of a mountain was landfill a couple hundred feet high. So when I was asked to take a climbing course down at Mount Rainier, it was intimidating to say the least. The reason I was asked to do that is our station, King Television, was asked to share a helicopter and the expenses with the U.S. Geological Survey and the University of Washington. Now, we flew up to Mount Baker because at that particular time, it was believed that Mount Baker was going to be the volcano most likely to erupt. You get this classic view from the San Juan Islands looking to the east of Mount Baker, which is 10,778 feet high. Let's go to our next image and we're going to take you into the crater. We helped the USGS and University of Washington scientists carry their gear down into the crater. You can see the sulfur, you see the steam. Uh, I think to the uninitiated, and I was most definitely one of those, a volcanic crater is a hellish place. I was definitely intimidated. It turned out the first person I interviewed on video was David. And while I was feeling some definite nerves, David was moving around as coolly as if he was just fixing coffee in the morning in his own kitchen. And that was infectious, as well as his passion for his science and also just his enthusiasm. He was a wonderful, enthusiastic person. And so we started talking at that point and had a wonderful time. We then ended up covering some of the other scientists who were down there. And as we move to the next slide, we're going to shift forward by about a year and a half. Remember we said that scientists believed Mount Baker was going to be the first one to erupt. It didn't progress in activity. And as Melanie very accurately pointed out, there was this Crandall-Molino report that was issued in that same year. 
that said, you know, Mount St. Helens is probably going to be a candidate for eruption. Now, this was in March of 1980, and anybody that's uh, lived in the Northwest very long knows you don't get many sunny days like this in the month of March. We did. You get this classic uh, profile of Mount St. Helens, uh, and it was often called the Fujiyama of America because it was this beautiful symmetric cone, very similar to Mount Fuji in Japan. Now, a little bit later in March, uh, March 20th, we began to see some earthquake activity. We drove down to the volcano uh, and literally rigged a microphone over our rear view mirror to act as a sort of seismograph uh, to see if there were jiggles. And that was sort of the end of the day. We drove back to Seattle. Seven days later, just one week later, I want to go to our next slide because there was, we heard there was an eruption. We had no scale to understand what this might mean. We flew down to the volcano, and this is what we saw. You can see this ash dirting near the summit and just below the summit. And it was what was called a phreatic explosion. Basically, as magma was slowly rising within the volcano, it was superheating the water within the internal plumbing system, and it turned to steam and blasted out. Now, if we go to the next image, we're going to literally look down on the crater that we saw on that particular day. And it opened up a crater, as you'll see here shortly, I believe, about a quarter mile in diameter. Now, we're going to see that in just a second. It turned out, there you go, uh, let's jump forward again. Turned out before we flew down there, I had called the University of Washington and said, uh, Stephen Malone, Dr. Stephen Malone, uh, seismologist uh, and geophysicist at the UW, if he could go with us. He said, I can't, but he said, how would you like it if we had a real volcanologist go with you? And I said, well, who would that be? Well, it was Dr. David Johnston. And I was very pleased to hear that. David and I had a sense of similarity. He had started out, started out in journalism, moved to science. We'd both grown up for at least part of our lives, him his entire life in Illinois, me for part of it, and uh, just had a good connection. So he flowed down with us at that point. And then I would go ahead and we landed on a nearby mountain ridge. And if we can go to our next slide, there was David and myself, uh, my back to the camera, doing an interview, talking about what the significance of, of this whole event was. Next image, I think, is just a closer one. And David was very good, not only at bringing us up to date on the science, but also putting it in perspective as to what it meant. And at one point, he had a quote that turned out to be uncannily prophetic. Let's go to our next image. He said, we stand next to a keg of dynamite. The fuse is lit but we don't know how long it is. If it were to explode right now, we would die. Now, I continued spending time down there, sometimes as long as 10 days in either campers or tents. Of course, David spent even more time down there. And on the morning of May 18th, we had been down there, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the program. The morning of May 18th, the volcano erupted. Uh, it was my job to fly in a helicopter as the volcano erupted, it was like popping the cork. Uh, 1,300 vertical feet of mountain simply exploded, and it decimated about 234 square miles of countryside. That released this heat, and that heat just uh, melted massive amounts of glacier that generated mud flows that were roughly moving at three-way speeds and roughly the consistency of wet cement. We were flying above that, flying beneath the ash, and trying to get a sense of what was going on. We couldn't see terribly well. Later that day, we retreated, uh, were asked to evacuate the area and move to a volcano, or not a volcano, a mountain just outside Olympia, and uh, did a series of broadcasts. And just before one of those broadcasts, my engineer handed me a small slip of paper. And he said, Jeff, this is the latest estimate of the number of missing and presumed dead. And I glanced at that and was stunned. And then before he turned away, he said, almost at a whisper, he said, I'm told we'll know some of the victims. Then it was time to go on the air. And I just was stunned. It was like my heart rose in my throat, my chest tightened. I had a sense of disconnect. The next day, we flew back into the volcanic uh, blast zone, what was sometimes called the death zone. And if we take a look at the next slide, this particular car was parked about 50 meters, 50 yards roughly from where we'd been camping. You can see how it had sandblasted off some of the paint. The aluminum and plastic grillwork work was melted in sort of a ropey mess. The person inside was dead. It was 
one of the first of people that we ended up identifying the location of so people could evacuate the bodies. And it changed the whole nature of that particular uh, experience. Uh, I still wondered who did I know that had died. I suspected Harry Truman, but as I found out all too soon, Dr. David Johnston was among those who perished. If you visit uh, the visitor center down at Mount St. Helens, let's go to our next picture, you'll see this memorial plaque and it lists all the people that perished in the eruption. And if you look in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see David Johnston's name. And in fact, I think we have a close-up. And when I found that out, it was no longer just a matter of having lost people I didn't know. I had lost somebody whose work I respected very greatly and who I had come to view as a friend. And that was profoundly troubling. It put it on a very different level of reality for me. Melanie, I think you have some further observations on that. Yes, if we can go to the next slide. So this is a list of the 57 names on that memorial. And uh, we always, when we talk about this science, we talk about the eruption. We're talking about uh, how volcanology had a growth spurt and and it, it reached a new level of mat maturity. Uh, the ecologists, you know, they came in to watch as a gray moonscape uh, rebounded to life with elk and pocket gophers and lupine and everything else. But first, you know, first and foremost, we have to always talk about the human toll. And so we know that this number could have been much larger if not for the efforts of people who were, um, you know, law enforcement and scientists. But we also don't just, we don't say just 57 because each one of these people uh, was somebody's mother or brother or father or best friend. And so um, I think, uh, that's that's the point that I'm trying that I want to make. So as as the scientists were trying so hard to try to protect all of those in harm's way, they definitely wanted that number to be zero, not 57. If you move to the next slide, please. And so that brings me to a quote uh, that I wanted to read tonight for you. Um, it's a favorite quote of David Johnston's. He uh, Han wrote it and he tacked it up on his on the door of his uh, childhood bedroom or teenage bedroom. It comes from Theodore Roosevelt and I'm just going to read it really quickly for you because I think it's germane to the topic we're talking about. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strides valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be among those timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. And so when we talk about great devotions and we talk about overcoming obstacles as we're trying to continue to do what we want to uh, achieve our goals, these pictures here are some of our first responders. So you've got a wild, wildfire in California. Bottom right is after 9-11. You know, of course, in the middle vision here, we have one of our healthcare workers and that, that really brings us to talking about the courage that it takes for all of the people who go out and do what they need to do to uh, protect, other, you know, protect other people that are in harm's way. And so what inspires them to act? You know, what inspires a scientist to do what they do or a volcanologist to do what they do or a grocery store worker or a mail carrier to do what they do? You know, it takes a lot of courage. And this brings us to the next topic that we want to talk about. Melanie, I think you make an excellent point that there are great examples of courage at Mount St. Helens leading up to, during, and certainly even after. And I think the question is, what parallels might exist between the experience at Mount St. Helens 
and what we're seeing right now with COVID-19, the pandemic, the experiences. And I think as we talked about this a little bit in preparation for tonight's program, I think there were several points that came out. And one is the emerging science of volcanology. Melanie, you alluded to that a little bit earlier. Uh, you might wonder what EID stands for in terms of uh, epidemiology. Uh, there, of course, that is a very mature science, so there continue to be discoveries that are being made, need to be made. But where that is emerging right now is this area of what we call emerging infectious diseases. Uh, and so this new development of science that we're beginning to understand more and more, and we're trying to persuade people to adopt the warnings, the concerns that come out of that, we've learned that three out of four new EIDs, or emerging infectious diseases, are transmitted from animals to human. There are human uh, influences there, there are environmental causes. Let's deal with the direct human causes first. We're seeing increasing population as one of those. Uh, increasing population density, more people living closer together. Uh, the food choices that they select, the use of antibiotics, often to excess in terms of raising livestock. Factory farming, there was a paper recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that said one of the reasons we're seeing more of these EIDs is because of our increasing dependence on high density raising of livestock. So those are the human, direct human elements. Let's look at some of the environmental, and we can stay on that particular slide. Uh, we are changing climate. Now, my other area of background is as an atmospheric scientist, and as we see temperatures warm, we're seeing shifting ranges of wildlife, plants, etc. They're moving farther north as temperatures warm, and they're moving farther upslope to higher elevations. This means that species of animals that never had contact with each other before are, and that means a new mode of possibly introducing pathogens, disease organisms. We're seeing habitats fragment, uh, animal populations are increasing and are coming into contact in smaller areas and with humans. Groups not ordinarily in contact are now in contact, and in fact, one of the fascinating if very troubling research uh, papers that I had a chance to read is focusing on Brazil as they're clearing more and more rainforest and they're doing mining and they're doing farming, et cetera. You're getting humans in contact with animals that they generally didn't have close contact with before. And the incidence of malaria in Brazil is rapidly increasing. So the sense of emerging scientific understanding as it relates to COVID, other viruses, other pathogens, especially these emerging infectious diseases, is that this is something that is going to be a new problem for us and we need to take very seriously. And Melanie, I know that was certainly the case in terms of volcano science back in 1980 and just prior to that, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. So when you had a team of scientists or volcanologists, seismologists there at the mountain in spring of 1980, they were, they were trying to put all those puzzle pieces together to see what all of it meant and really they couldn't predict right and that's that's really a word that you won't find a volcanologist using predict or prediction what they were doing was trying to tell uh, the public and government and decision makers emergency service managers they're trying to tell them what they were seeing so they were seeing that growing bulge on the north side of the volcano and they were trying to say, what could happen? Uh, well, it would eventually come loose and an avalanche come down. So, but they couldn't say with any definity, you know, 100% because the science had not reached that point. So I guess the parallel that we're seeing here is continuing to advance the science that would protect people in harm's way of, of a volcano as well as to the emerging infectious diseases, which is really a global issue, not just a, um, it's not just one country, you know? Definitely. Uh, I think uh, Melanie has up access issues. This was also a parallel between the two. There were a lot of property issues that came up in the red zone. Certainly it was over a much smaller geographic area, but property owners of cabins, various other properties within this red zone uh, in which only scientists, law enforcement officials, and a few journalists were uh, permitted to enter. 
uh, it led to a lot of pressure. People started hearing stories that there were break-ins and damage and vandalism to their properties. So there was an increasing agitation to allow them to go in. And then Governor Dixie Lee Ray agreed to that. On May 17th, there was the first of what were supposed to be two tours, and I joined that. And there was a caravan of people escorted by state troopers and local county sheriffs that went in. And it was safe. It was uh, uh, not a remarkable experience. It was a beautiful day. And I remember sitting there having a soft drink right at the foot of Mount St. Helens near Spirit Lake and thinking, boy, it's tempting to stay here. But of course, we were told to leave. The next day, May 18th, they were scheduled to assemble again that morning. And I think the issue here that's of note is that people had, or the mountain had erupted just perhaps an hour to an hour and a half later, instead of 57 people dead, you would have probably had triple, maybe even 10 times that many people that would have died because there would have been people literally right at the foot of the volcano or moving in. And remember, it wasn't just the blast. I spoke earlier of that mud flow that was moving at freeway speeds. That moved down the North Fork of the Tudor River, down to the Cowlitz, and would have engulfed a lot of people who would have been driving up roads at that point. So we see those same sorts of access issues where people say, we don't want to do that. That's an infringement on our uh, freedom, uh, our property rights, et cetera. But there can be some very good reasons for that. And I think we saw those with Mount St. Helens, and we're seeing them certainly in the excellent response that we're getting right here in Washington state. Melanie, uh, I think you have some other points to make on that too. Right, so the property issues, there were many different issues that came into play. So you had cabin owners, you had lodges that attracted tourists, um, you had Boy Scout camps, so um, you had a national forest. So there were a lot of different issues that came into play. Now, there were road closures right away, uh, but there was the state directive or the executive order signed by Governor Dixie, Ray, Dixie Lee Ray uh, was April 30th. So you actually had the whole month of April where all these issues were kind of kind of teetering, you know, in, in the balance. You didn't have a state directive, so you, you did have people that were asking why can't I go get my, my things? Why can't I go in t and get my, my stuff from the cabins? Um, so, and that was just a few weeks. That was, what, 18 days, really, before it erupted. So, I think the other issue then is, and you alluded to some of that, Melanie, are the economic issues on that. Back in St. Helens, uh, we had the, of course, the property that was inaccessible. You had logging areas that were shut down. That was a major logging area then. And uh, certainly some businesses ended up closing or at least had their income impacted as fewer and fewer people could come down to that immediate area. And of course, we're looking at business closures, loss of uh, livelihood right now. So we have some of those same uh, sources of pressure, some of those same concerns being experienced. I think for that's right. That's right, Jeff. And so, you know, that when, so at, at Mount Baker, which you mentioned in 1978, there were closures. And let me just point out the US Geological Survey does not make decisions to close roads or any of that. So they can tell what they are observing, uh, the conditions, and then a team of decision makers decide whether to close. So at Mount Baker in 1978, there were closures that lasted through their peak season. And so they lost a lot of revenue there. And, and you really do have empathy for those businesses, just as we have empathy for the businesses that are hurting now with the COVID. Um, you know, and so at the end of that period of closure at, at Mount Baker, there was no eruption. And so people said, oh my goodness, you know, look what happened. We closed for this whole peak season and there was no eruption. This science, the science is not exact. And I would, I would venture to say that the emerging infectious disease uh, science, area of science is not exact either. We're, we're trying so hard. People are, those practitioners are trying so hard to get a handle on what we should be doing and what comes next. 
I think the fourth point is the resistance to science, both today and also then. Uh, when it's inconvenient, when it potentially could cause a loss of income or revenue, uh, very often the response is to question the science. And of course, it certainly should be examined. But I think then there were a, sim or a series of responses that started uh, coming out back in 1980, uh, people saying, well, those scientists, those geologists or volcanologists didn't know what they were talking about. It's just a theory, which I think to scientists, we look at that and say they're mixing up a theory for a hypothesis. A hypothesis is an educated guess as to what might be responsible. A theory is something that has been well tested, been validated by another independent group and has accepted science. So that's not a valid response. Uh, others just simply didn't like it and said a, had a variety of different responses, some of which I don't think would be fit to share on this uh, broadcast, but uh, they were just rejecting the idea of experts or expertise and thought that somehow, even though they had no training in the field, that their opinions were perfectly equally valid. Uh, I think now we certainly hear the same questioning of people like Dr. Fauci, uh, other MDs, infectious disease experts that we hear, and the World Health Organization. So we see the same sort of resistance to science when it's viewed as inconvenient or potentially causing economic loss. Yes, and I'll just jump in there with, uh, there's, so there's a infectious disease expert. I was, I was reading about him today, Dennis Carroll who uh, worked for the CDC as well as USAID, which is an agency uh, that had the pandemic team working. And he said that he, he was talking about how these zoonotic spillovers, this is a science that we, that our infectious disease uh, people have known about and for a very long time. And so, but we're very resistant to this kind of science because it's not economically convenient, uh, it, of course, population comes into play, and no one really wants to deal with uh, overpopulation. There's a lot of people who who do uh, downplay the uh, the tragedy, really, of what can be uh, caused by overpopulation, which is definitely that interconnection, that interplay between wild animals and humans, which is happening more and more as population grows to almost eight billion. And we're seeing that same sort of trend that you were alluding to, Melanie, in terms of we have a sense of what the threat is, what the risks are in many cases, and yet we're beginning to see a peel back of some uh, regulations that would increase the safety factor rather than decrease it. And so some of these same elements that we saw with Mount St. Helens, and you get a sense looking in that left panel, that was a picture I took, at how total the devastation was. And to give you another measure of the power of that blast. One day I was flying down, and this was a couple of weeks after the eruption, we were flying in our helicopter over Spirit Lake, and the geologist that was on board the helicopter with me said, do you notice that you see logs well up the slope but not below that? And I said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. He said, that marks how high the wave was. Basically, as all that debris came slamming into Spirit Lake, it set up a humongous wave that rebounded off the far slopes of the mountains around Spirit Lake, and then washed back out and into the North Fork of the Tudor River Valley. And I believe the estimate at that time is that that wave height was probably something on the sort of 600 feet. And that was just another measure of the absolute power of that eruption. So I think from this, I think the question that comes up is, what have we learned? So let's go on to our next image and it could be what we've learned or what we need to learn. And I think there are two different elements there. And one is the guidance of science. When there's good science or science available, we need to let that guide our decisions. And the second uh, is to build and maintain relationships. In terms of the science uh, guiding our decisions, I think we can just hearken back to Mount St. Helens, that idea that had that been followed more seriously, uh, by the scientists, by the law enforcement officials, we would have not had tours going in because they were flirting with death on that Saturday, May 17th. And certainly it was just sheer luck uh, or blessing, depending on how you want to look at it, that we didn't have hundreds die as a result of that decision to go ahead with the tour on May 18th. 
I think the second point on this, building and maintaining relationships, uh, I saw uh, unexpectedly after the eruption by some months, there was a conference and I happened to be attending it as a science reporter and had shown a few of my slides. And a gentleman uh, came up to me afterward and it turned out he was a Russian volcanologist. And uh, if we go to our next slide, he said, you know, we had a volcano uh, on the Kamchatka Peninsula uh, that was part of the USSR, now is part of the Russian Federation. You can tell this is a long time ago. Look at the dog sled there. And you see the steam coming out the summit. That was Mount Bezimiani. Now, if we go to a closer image of that, we'll see that Bezimiani erupted, began to erupt March 30th of 1956. Now there you see how it was largely uh, a very symmetrical cone, as was Mount St. Helens prior to the eruption. Look at the next side-by-side -side set of images of Bezimiani on the left, Mount St. Helens on the right. Bezimiani, you see this sort of horse collar, if you will, that had opened up by this lateral blast, and then you see the lava dome coming up, and you see virtually the same thing. This would have been the next year in 81 uh, in the image that I took at uh, Mount St. Helens. So that's where we need to maintain these lines of communication, both within our country and with other countries, because there's so much we can learn and there's so much we can share. Melanie, what's, uh, I know that, I think David had been very familiar with this instance of the Bezimiani eruption, had he not? Right, so one of the main scientists that were there, that was there in 1980, had said to me in an interview uh, that David was the first person that he heard compare what was going on at Mount St. Helens to a report that had come out on Mount Bezimiani. Um, so what's the mechanism that is in play here uh, is called the laterally directed blast. A lot of people say lateral blast and volcanologists, no, no, don't say that. <laughs> the laterally directed blast mechanism was not well understood um, at Mount Bezimiani. After Mount St. Helens, that is when the mechanism was studied and better defined. There was a report though that came out on that and David was familiar with it. And yes, he did bring it up as a topic of conversation and a comparable, a possible comparable uh, in 1980. I don't know about Bezimiani, but uh, because this was in a very remote area, uh, Mount St. Helens, uh, all of a sudden, there was the observation that the north face of the volcano was beginning to bulge out. And there was the concern that that, and it turned out to be absolutely true, that magma was rising, it was placing pressure on that north face, it was essentially inflating like a balloon. And when that earthquake occurred on May 18th, that that uh, area that was inflating like a balloon essentially failed, and that led to that laterally directed blast that you talked about. Yes. I think one of the things that you and I talked about a little bit earlier, Melanie, was that as we exit this and perhaps open it up for some questions and answers, uh, we want to leave people with a positive sense of empowerment of where you can take some of this information, what you can do with it. And one of those examples for me, and I speak, I volunteer as a uh, diver conservation uh, instructor, I guess you could say, at the Seattle Aquarium. Let's, and this is an example that I use or a story I use. Let's go to our next slide if we can. Oop, I think you had a little bit more to share, Melanie. Oh, um, yes. Following on to the last slide where you were we were talking about uh, how important it is to uh, have those relationships with other researchers around the world. So when it comes to volcanology, VDAP is a team that was formed in 1985 under USAID, which is the US Agency for International Development. So um, VDAP, Volcano Disaster Assistance Program, was formed as a way to um, respond to these disasters or help other volcanologists around the world uh, prepare uh, for their disaster, you know, disaster planning, um, and when when a disaster would be uh, happening, they could they could assist them. Uh, the next point, please. 
And so it's interesting to note that within USAID is where the program was housed for the Emerging Pandemic Threats Team that was formed in 2005 under President Bush uh, and was expanded in 2009. And there, they were, uh, that team was tasked with identifying viruses and animals and uh, working on wilderness management practices. And that's where those relationships and working with other researchers around the world is very important. So, um, of course, we, we've heard the news uh, headlines that that uh, EPT program was ended, the funding was ended in 2019. Um, but that is, uh, that is one of the benefits that, that follows on to what we were talking about, of working with researchers around the world. As I look at that left picture, and that was one that uh, uh, I had taken, uh, and that was the year after in 1981, I believe it was July, and I want to say it was July 22nd, but I won't trust my memory from almost 40 years ago that well. I think that highlights the fact that we have to be very cautious in following these uh, warnings. At that time, it was believed that Mount St. Helens was pretty quiet. There was some minor dome building at that point. We had gone in with a geologist, I believe it was from the state of Washington, and it was believed that it was in a relatively quiescent uh, point. Went in there, went down to Spirit Lake. 40 minutes after we had left the crater, uh, we had a prearranged warning with our helicopter pilots and low clouds had moved in. You can see some of those around that area, uh, but he wanted us back in the helicopter in a hurry. We jumped in the helicopter. This is a very safe pilot. Uh, had flown Chinooks, the uh, twin rotor that were uh, commonly in service in Vietnam for transporting large equipment or large numbers of troops. And he didn't even wait for us to fully get belted and he was taking off. We're saying, what's going on, Mark? And he didn't say anything. We kept flying down the North Fork of the Tudor River Valley. Finally, he said, okay, clouds have broken, look back. We looked up and we saw this giant eruption plume that you can see and we realized had we not left that crater uh, when we did, uh, that we would have been in there when that went off. And so that shows even the best uh, estimates are often not cautious enough. And that's why we really need to follow those. Uh, you know, it's, it's fortunate on several different accounts that I'm here to be participating in this tonight. And that's just another example of that. Uh, I think as uh, Melanie points out that there are some inspirations that we can follow with this. And we started to go into that. If we can go to the next slide, I think as we look at ways that we can put this into practice, Baba Dioum, who's an inspirational Senegalese uh, conservationist, has a very famous quote, and it is, for in the end, we will only conserve what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. And I think that speaks to what all of us can do, and I think it really speaks to the mission of the Mount St. Helens Institute, that the Institute does so very well in educating more people to help them understand this uh, so that they understand the risks that they have a love for the Cascade volcanoes. And with that love, there comes the call to conserve and there also comes the call to respect it and respect its power. But I think when we look at Baba Dioum, he offers us great wisdom, but I think the greatest wisdom came from our friend, Dr. David Johnston. And I'd, I'd like to finish my little part of this presentation with a quote from David. Let me tell you that after the eruption, uh, I was going to be going back to visit my family in Wisconsin, just north of Chicago. And I thought that maybe David's family would enjoy seeing some videotapes of interviews. So I wrote them, figuring that they'd probably say, no, it's too soon, but maybe next year. And uh, David's dad, Tom, said, did you say you're going to be back in the area? He said, I'd like to meet with you. So we did meet, we had a, a wonderful conversation. Uh, you find out that very often what people most want is not for you to say the right thing, but to simply listen to them and maybe help fill in some of the gaps of their knowledge. So we were getting ready to go. Tom said, uh, David's dad said, you know, Jeff, there was part of me that wishes I'd never encouraged his interest in volcanoes, but he used to say to me, dad, for me, each day is a new opportunity to learn something new, to get better at what you do, and to use that knowledge and skill to help other people. And David certainly did that with his life. And Melanie highlights that so, uh, so aptly and so skillfully in her book. 
And that's, I think, part of the legacy of David, and it's part of the legacy that is carried forth by the Mount St. Helens Institute, and it's something each of us can do, to recognize that each day is a gift, to learn something a little new, to get better at what we do, to improve our knowledge, and to look to help other people. And so uh, I've been delighted to have this opportunity to join in. I suspect there will be some questions, but Melanie, I think you have a parting thought or two as well. Yes, thank you, Jeff. And I really appreciate you sharing that quote of David's. Uh, another quote that's linked to that or associated with that would be, um, after David defended his PhD dissertation, he called his parents and he said, you know, whatever else I do, I have added a link in the chain. Mm -hmm. So adding a link in the chain of knowledge is what scientists do, whether you're talking about medical science, earth science. Uh, and so he was very proud of that. And he believed in that. And so we know that David died in the pursuit of advancing this, this science that he loved so much. And I think that um, besides the fact that he was a really wonderful scientist, he was just a really nice guy. He was a good guy from, from so many people who knew him growing up and in college and his colleagues. And so, you know, honoring his legacy uh, means continuing the science that he was studying. And he believed in science as an emblem of hope. And I think we can all hopefully do that and hold on to that idea. Most definitely. And so I'm, I'm open to any questions. Uh, I think if, if ta there's Taylor. <laughs> Hi, Taylor. <laughs> Hi, thank you guys so much um, for just a really wonderful presentation folks on our Facebook page are really, really thoroughly enjoying our, um, your discourse about David Johnston, about how to relate it to what we're going through today. Um, and a question from our executive director, Ray Yerkowitz, is how do we convince people to embrace the power of science to answer questions and address the major issues in our world? You know, we see this as a problem even today, just as we did in during the eruption of the 1980s. Um, and folks are still resistant. So how would either of you or both of you approach this challenge? I would say two things, and I say this as a meteorologist as well as a science journalist, is that people get the idea that science is a body of knowledge. And, you know, certainly that's there. But basically, it's a very powerful means of discovery and of asking questions. And I think one of the best things we can do as we see young people as they come in uh, to the Institute as they participate in other programs is let them experience that joy of how they answer questions. And I think that experience is really going to help them. In terms of uh, older folk, and I certainly qualify for that, I guess, is just remind them of the role that it's plays. We would not land, have landed people on the moon if it had not been for science and engineering. Uh, we'd not have had the many successes in the medical field if it was not for science and engineering. And I think you have all these examples and it's when you begin to doubt science and its power, especially the scientific method and how it's laid out and corroborated and vetted by other scientists, uh, we are basically saying we don't believe in that either. I have a response. As a writer, I would tell you that uh, getting people to believe in embracing certain ideas is about storytelling. And so yep. <clears throat> by, by writing this book, uh, people are learning. It, it makes volcanology accessible to a lay person. Uh, mm -hmm. It also makes the life of someone like David Johnston, who's very revered in the Pacific Northwest in the places very close to Mount St. Helens, it makes his life more accessible. So if we're going to talk about um, how we can do things better, we actually have to start at the human level. We have to tell a story. We have to talk about the people, an actual person studying the science. And so, and what happened? You know, those 57 names that we listed up there, I can tell you the stories. I mean, we can read stories about each and every one of them. Mm -hmm. And so it really does belong at the human level. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And on a similar note, Erin Wilder on Facebook asked, um, can you speak to the pushback that Dr. Johnson received being a voice of dissension against the rest of the scientific community prior to the eruption of Mount St. Helens? I think it speaks to the fact that science doesn't speak, at least initially, with one voice. Uh, mm -hmm. That there is dissension, there is debate, uh, that there's this self-correcting nature of science that you have different views, and I can speak to that in meteorology. Sometimes in our office, we'd have two different meteorologists. We'd both have at least slightly different ideas, and we'd engage in a little bit of debate about that. But I think over time, there is this discussion, uh, and people begin to converge on what the proper answer was. And I think at that point, as we approached May 18th, the scientists were generally coming together. Uh, would you agree that from the research that you did, Melanie? Oh, sure. I mean, yes. So they were all coming together and meeting daily and, and sharing what they were seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, measurements and observations. Um, if you're talking about David receiving pushback on some of the things that he was saying, which was really blown out of proportion, uh, you know, talking about getting reprimanded, that did not happen. Um, but, but I will share that in his last conversation with, with his family, you know, he, he was bummed. He felt like he, he was sharing what he saw uh, and he, he did feel like some people did put him in the category of alarmist. Mm. And so um, that just speaks to the idea. I, I love what you just said, Jeff, self-correcting nature of science. And so we, scientists are gonna have different views. That's, that's how that works. So you're going to have one scientist who says, you know, I think this is what could happen. And you're going to have another scientist who says, no, I think, it, you know, the impact is going to be minimal. And that was, that was, that was some of that, some of that was happening in 1980. Certainly happened uh, and is happening this year too. Exactly. Well, that, there, there's another parallel. <laughs> yeah. Melanie, here's a, question from friend Pat Pringle. What inspired you to write about Dr. Johnston besides growing up with his sister? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It's a, it's a views and brews, so hold on. <laughs> we know that's just water in the cup, ass. <clears throat> <Shh. laughs> okay, uh, so what inspired me? Um, I'm a writer and I'm a nonfiction writer. So uh, the job of a writer is to recognize a story when it presents itself. And so even though I had known his, David's sister uh, for three decades, three, three and a half, three decades, um, we didn't talk about him. It was just one of those things between, one of those conversations between friends. Uh, we never approached it because we were, uh, because I didn't, I hadn't met him personally. And only when I lost my own brother did we have a conversation about lost brothers, you know. Uh, what inspired me? So I I just always thought it was so, I think the little bit that she did tell me started with the Oak Lawn tornado. And I thought it was so, such a tragic coincidence of him surviving this deadly tornado in his hometown and then being taken by a completely different natural disaster. I always, that just always struck me. I thought there was a story there. Um, and so in a conversation between friends, uh, her son actually went to school to do writing and we were just talking about why doesn't he write about his uncle? And then so it just ended up sort of being volleyed back to me. So, you know, there was a movie made about uh, Mount St. Helens a year after the eruption and David was one of the two characters, or someone supposedly based on David. And I will tell you the reason that this exists, this book exists, is to set the record straight. Uh, that movie was slapped together by um, people that did not research anything having to do with David himself. It made him into a troublemaker, a conspiracy theorist, and so this book exists to set that record straight. And maybe that's as a friend of his family, maybe that's a big, a big incentive. Maybe the biggest incentive is, of all is to try to heal that hurt, which actually 
once you've had your family member disparaged like that in the limelight, it's, it's hard to heal. It was a horrible movie. I saw that year and I almost threw my supersized super, super gulp, whatever they call it at the screen, uh, because it so uh, yeah. parted from the reality of Dave. And most of the focus was on Harry Truman, who was an interesting character. But we get some wonderful movies that tell wonderful stories uh, out of the movie industry. But this was uh, just, I think, an attempt to take advantage of the interest in Mount St. Helens. And uh, I would say on the flip side of that, if you ever get a chance to see the, I believe it's Dateline or it's an NBC program, we'll meet again. And it spoke of how David saved the life of a young, uh, I believe, glaciologist who wanted to stay at Mount St. Helens because she was researching this. He said, this is not a safe place. And uh, that's, that's a wonderful program. If you ever get a chance to stream that or see that, that one was well done. There are two women, uh, one of whom devoted the rest of her career to working at the David A. Johnston Cascades Volcano Observatory. And uh, the other person who was in that PBS documentary, uh, she's also devoted her, the rest of her career to uh, protecting people. Uh, early earthquake warnings, I think, is her passion. <laughs> you know, and we should uh, point out, uh, I've been fortunate enough to go down to the USGS uh, office in Vancouver. And uh, of course, the famous saying when the mountain erupted was Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. David was radi radioing it, uh, that call. And the number of dedicated scientists that are working so hard to continue to monitor Mount St. Helens, the other volcanoes, and advance the understanding of volcanology and the geology of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, you know, we don't hear their names. We don't often see them on television or other settings, but they are doing important, important work and definitely uh, deserve all of our respect and thanks. And uh, funding support, I would add, too. Good point. That's true. That's true that our scientists usually do toil in obscurity until something, I mean, we would have never known the name Dr. Fauci. <laughs> None of us would know it, except now we do because of a disaster. Melanie, we have a lot of people watching who are interested in where we can find your book. Where's the best oh. place for us to purchase it? Well, uh, it came out from University of Illinois Press, so I would love to direct you there. Um, Amazon has tons of business, especially with everything that's been going on, so I would love to direct you to uh, University of Illinois Press website. They have online sales, it's available as an ebook uh, or a print book. Great. Thank you both so much. Um, we've just really appreciated having you here. And thank you all for joining us this evening. And I think we're going to wrap up today, but make sure to tune in next Monday and the Monday following 6 p.m. Pacific time. Next week is our 40 years of survival and revival at Mount St. Helens with author and biologist Eric Wagner. In the meantime, visit our website and follow Mount St. Helens Institute on social media. We're offering several stay-at-home activities through our new campaign of MSH Inside, and we hope to explore the volcano with you soon. Melanie and Jeff, thank you both so much. Thank you very thank much. You. Hello to all of you out there as well. <laughs> and you have stay a great, safe. Have a great <laughs> night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>